Good morning. My name is Leo Kaplan, and it is my honor to introduce and welcome Father Greg Boyle, who is visiting from my hometown of Los Angeles. Father Greg, or G as he is affectionately known, is a Jesuit priest and the founder of Homeboy Industries. Homeboy began in 1988 and has grown into the largest and most effective gang intervention agency in the country. Homeboy Industries provides hope, training, and support to formerly gang involved and previously incarcerated men and women, allowing them to redirect their lives and become contributing members of our community. Each year, Homeboy welcomes nearly 9,000 people through its doors who are seeking to transform their lives while serving over 7,700 community clients, along with providing an 18 month reentry program that serves over 400 men and women each year. Homeboy has become a blueprint for over 250 organizations and social enterprises around the world, from Alabama to Scotland through its global Homeboy network, which creates therapeutic communities that offer job skills training, cost-free programs and services, and social enterprise employment. Father Greg is the author of several books, including the New York Times best-selling Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion. He has, received, he has received numerous honorary degrees, awards, and recognitions, including the Civil, Civic Medal of Honor, the California Peace Prize, and Humanitarian of the Year by Bon Appetit magazine. In 2011, he was inducted into the California Hall of Fame, and in 2014, Father Greg was recognized by the White House as a champion of change. I first met Father Greg when I was 10 years old when he came to speak at my elementary school in LA. I'm thrilled he is, he is with us today. Please give a warm welcome to Father Greg Boyle. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be with you, a privilege to know Leo and his family for all these years. And uh, I was happy that I could, uh, I was in Fair at Fairfield University last night, so happy to be with you today. Uh, what Martin Luther King says about uh, church could well be said about your time here at Taft. It's not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from. And you go from here uh, to reimagine the world so it might look differently than it currently looks. Uh, and that is something that's probably right on time. You want to imagine a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. Uh, the hope is that you will go from here and imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. You go from here to dismantle the barriers that exclude. And, and the only way to kind of do that, I think, is to inch your way out to the margins, however you imagine them. And if you stand out at the margins, look under your feet, the margins get erased because you chose to stand there and you stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, and you stand with those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And every once in a while, wow, what a privilege it is to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. You go to the margins and you get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and you stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And you create a community of kinship. No kinship, no peace, no kinship, no justice, no kinship, no equality, no matter how singularly focused you may well be on those worthy goals. The truth of the matter is they can't happen unless there's some undergirding sense that we are connected. Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? And we inch our way to the margins. Taft is not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from so that you can create this new world and you brace yourselves because folks will accuse you of wasting your time at the margins. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. You go from here and other voices get heard. It's the privilege of my life for 35 years. I've worked with gang members in Los Angeles. 
and the day will never come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than the thousands and thousands of men and women I've been privileged to know. People like Louis Bettis, who was kind of a uh, force of nature, gang member, heroin addict, uh, shot caller from his gang in prison. And for about 10 years, he kind of ran the place. Uh, he also was a good speaker. He was always invited to give talks, especially in high schools. They would ask for him by name. He and I, we went out to dinner and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. And he was saying, you know, you gotta pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. And I said, yeah, no shit, that's good advice. Uh, and, and the day won't ever come when I have to carry more than this young man has had to carry. The homies have taught me everything of value about what kinship is, where there is no us and them, there's just us. And one of the things they taught me in the last few years is how to text, and I, I'm so grateful to them because I find it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And, and I'm pretty good at it, LOL and OMG and BTW, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. And, and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. I know I can't be alone in being vexed by this stupid autocorrect thing. You know, um, you know, the, a homegirl named Bertha, a tough cookie, on one Sunday, uh, she texted me and she said, uh, where are you at? And I said, I am about to speak to a room full of monjas. And those of you who take Spanish here know that monjas means nuns, sisters, religious women. So I said, I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas and I pushed send and autocorrect told her that I was about to speak to a room full of ninjas, <laughs> which she thought was pretty darn interesting. Even now, I've been on the road a lot uh, for the last uh, week and a half now, and, and uh, the homies, their hair is always on fire, and they go, oh my God, they're gonna cut off my lights, and I'm gonna get evicted, and my car note, or whatever it is, you know, and they always need money, and this homie needed $100, uh, a homie who works at Homeboy, needed $100 to finish off his rent, and I, I just didn't have it, so I wrote back simply, things are tight. And I pushed send, and autocorrect told him, thongs are tight. <laughs> and he wrote back, sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, what, what about my rent? So there I am in a car with two older vatos, Manuel and Poncho, who work at Homeboy, and we have, you know, uh, 500 people who work there at any given time, gang members in our training program, and they're gonna help me give a talk at a high school, and we're driving to Palm Desert. And we just had our morning meeting, as you call yours, the morning meeting, where we gather in the, in the lobby, and we say a prayer, and somebody gives a thought for the day, and so we're in the car, and Manuel's in shotgun in the front seat, and we're 15 minutes on the road, when he gets an incoming text and he reads it and he chuckles. And I said, what is it? And he goes, oh, it's dumb, it's from Snoopy, back at the office. Well, I just seen him. He just greeted me with a big abrazo as the day was beginning. Snoopy and Manuel work together in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gang members who work there. It is a tough job, I would not want it, because occasionally gang members can be attitudinal. So um, I said, well, what's he say? And he goes, oh, it's dumb, hang on a second. Hey dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, we died laughing, the three of us. I nearly drove into oncoming traffic and and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other because I remember. And now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them? Well, Homeboy was started a long time ago, 1988, when I had hair and it was, uh, uh, I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission. I'm a Jesuit priest. 
And uh, the parish was nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village, and together it comprised the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other in this parish, which is unheard of in public housing, uh, leading the LAPD to name my parish as the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in all of Los Angeles. I didn't know that when I drove up. And in Los Angeles, we have 120,000 gang members, 1,100 gangs. If LA is the gang capital of the world, my parish was the gang capital of Los Angeles. I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in 1988. And I buried my 231st two weeks ago. Not all from that community, but I run an extremely large gang intervention program, I get asked to do this. So the first thing we did was we started a school because there were so many junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school, nobody wanted them. So in the middle of the day, they were wreaking havoc, they were violent, they were selling drugs, they were writing on walls. So I would walk out to them and I would say, hey, you know, uh, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, every single one said, yeah, you know, I would. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them. You know, that's, that sort of forced my hand. So right across the street from the, the church is our, our parochial school. Grades K to 8 occupy the first two floors. But the entire third floor was the convent where the ninjas lived, and so I uh, gathered all the nuns together one evening in the living room. I sat them down. I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out, and uh, we could turn the convent into a school for gang members, and they looked at each other, and they said, sure. So that was the extent of their discernment process, and, and that brought a large numbers of gang members to the church property, which created a disconnect. You know, people in the parish would come up to me and they say, wait a minute, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out. And I thought it was a good gospel challenge. And then the gang member said, if only we had jobs, so myself and the women, we marched around the factories that surrounded the housing projects trying to find felony-friendly employers and that wasn't so forthcoming, so we invented things, a maintenance crew, a landscaping crew, a crew to build our child care center, all made up of rival enemy gang members from the eight gangs in my parish. And then, uh, none of you were born when this happened, but it was uh, 1992, after the Rodney King verdict, the whole city of Los Angeles exploded, at least every pocket of poverty, but not the poorest pocket. My parish didn't ignite, and the LA Times wanted to know why that was, so they interviewed me, and I told them, well, maybe it's because we have 60 strategically hired gang members who work side by side with their enemies, and they have a reason to get up in the morning and, and a reason not to gangbang the night before, and more to the point of your question, a reason not to torch their own community. So the article appeared the next day. Well, the following day, I get a phone call from a movie producer in Hollywood named Ray Stark, who happened to have $500 million. So he summoned me to his Beverly Hills office, and he said, how should I spend my money? As I look back on it now, I see I woefully undershot my request. But I, I said, well, you know, there's an abandoned bakery across the street from the school, it has ovens, they don't work. You could buy the place, you could fix the ovens. You could put, I don't know, hair nets on rival enemy gang members. They could bake bread. We could call it Homeboy Bakery. That was the extent of my business plan. And, and he said, sure. So we were off and running. Uh, a, a month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market in downtown LA. Once we had plural, we changed our name from Jobs for a Future to Homeboy Industries. 
as if there was any industry involved in this, you know, and not everything worked, you know, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy plumbing really was not hugely successful. Um, who knew? Uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I did not see that coming, but. And now nobody ever intends to do such a thing, but we backed our way, we've evolved our way. Now we're the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on our planet Earth. 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors wanting to reimagine their lives. It's mainly a place for healing because everybody comes through our doors with what psychologists would call a disorganized attachment. Mom was frightening or frightened and you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. So they find rest from their chronic toxic stress. They find a community of tenderness that holds them. They gain resilience. They leave us after 18 months and now the world will throw at them what it will, but this time they're not toppled. So we have, everybody's in therapy. We have four paid therapists, uh, 47 volunteer therapists, including two psychiatrists, case managers, lots of classes, navigators, free tattoo removal, no place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos than we do. We have a designated clinic, uh, with uh, three laser machines, one paid physician assistant, 43 volunteer doctors. So if anyone's starting to regret that rhino tattoo you have, uh, just see me afterwards. And we have nine social enterprises and training programs, solar panel installation, we have a welding program, we have Homeboy Bakery is thriving, Homeboy Homegirl merchandise where we sell our logo stuff. Um, Homeboy silk screen, uh, homeboy recycling where we recycle e electronic waste. We have a diner at, at City Hall, the only place you can get food there. If you ever fly to LA, American Airlines Terminal 4, uh, we have a restaurant there, farmer's markets. We have a thing called uh, Homeboy Grocery where um, we, chill, we sell chips, salsas, and guacamole in, in Stop and Shop. Is that here? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think we're in five states on, on the east, and we're in Walmarts on the west. And uh, what else? Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude will gladly take your order. <laughs> and they cater. I, I invite you to go there because it's kind of a who's who. You're always going to run into a celeb or a movie star, Jim Carrey or Forrest Whitaker or Jack Black. Even once with two hours notice from the Secret Service, uh, Vice President Joe Biden uh, showed up, entourage and uh, selfies with Uncle Joe. And, and once famously, uh, Diane Keaton showed up, uh, a movie star, Oscar winner, Annie Hall, Godfather movies. She showed up for lunch. And her waitress was Glenda, and Glenda's a big girl. Been there, done that, tattooed, felon, parolee, gang member. She has no idea who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And Glenda rattles off the three dishes she really likes, and, and Diane Keaton says, well, I'll have that second one. That one sounds really good. And, it's at that moment something dawns on Glenda. She looks at Diane Keaton, she says, wait a minute, I feel like I know you from somewhere, you know, like maybe we've met. And Diane Keaton decides to deflect it humbly, oh gosh, I don't know, I suppose I, I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And, and then Glenda goes, no, now I know. <laughs> we were locked up together. <laughs> Honest to God, that just took my breath away when I heard it, and I, I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings, <laughs> now that I think of it. But suddenly, kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind, and if you'll permit me, Jesus says to the gathered that you may be one it's about kinship, it's about standing against forgetting that we belong to each other. 
Every single one of you will go from Taft to choose to be enlightened witnesses. People who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love return people to themselves. At Homeboy, we're allergic to the notion of holding the bar up and asking homies to measure up. We don't. We hold the mirror up, tell them the truth. You're exactly what God had in mind when God made you. Then they become that truth. They inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. We look at them and say what the Buddhists say in a great many of the writings. Oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. Or it's like the Christmas carol, long lay the world in sin and error, pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Yeah, it's about Jesus and yeah, it's about Christmas, but how is it not the job description of every one of you? You appear and the soul feels its worth. But at Homeboy, we know you have to reach in and you have to dismantle messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way that keep people from seeing their truth. There's a line in the Acts of the Apostles which kind of leaps out at you and it says simply this, and awe came upon everyone. And it suggests that the measure of health in any community, including this one, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. So a, a number of years ago, I was invited to speak to 600 uh, social workers in Richmond, Virginia, and it was an all day nine to five, what they call a gang in service where you get credits. And I'd been at those before and they have keynotes, they have breakout sessions, workshops. So it's in a hotel ballroom from nine to five. And I, I, so I said yes and I bought my ticket. Well, a week before I was to fly, I pull out the original inviting letter and I, to my horror, I discover that I am to be the only speaker from nine to five all damn day. And I said to myself, oh, hell no. So, so I invited two homies in, Andre and Jose, and I sit them down and they're trainees. They've been there like nine months of their 18 months. And I said, look, at the end of the week, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up and tell your stories to 600 social workers. Take your time because uh, we got a long ass day to fill. And I'd never heard their stories. And uh, so Jose got up first and he's uh, 25 years old, I guess at the time. Gang member, tattooed, been to prison. We have phases at, at, in our 18 months. So his phase that he was currently in, he had become a very valued member of our substance abuse team, a man solid in his own recovery. Now he's helping younger homies and homegirls with their addiction issues. So not only had he been in prison, but he had a long stretch as a heroin addict and a long stretch as a homeless man. So he gets up in front of 600 social workers and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasp. And he says, it sounds way worse in Spanish, he said. And, and they went from gasp to laugh. And then he continued, I guess I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California. And she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door and the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me and my grandmother rescued me. 
My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day, my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through. and Second t-shirt, because you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion, and he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded? if I don't welcome my own wounds. And awe came upon everyone. The measure of your compassion lies not in your service of those on the margins, but only in your willingness to see yourselves in kinship with them. For the truth of the matter is this, if, if you don't welcome your own wounds, you may well be tempted to despise the wounded. For there is an idea that's taken root in the world. It's at the root of all that's wrong with it. And the idea is this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. You go from Taft to stand against that idea. Let me end with this. It occurs sometimes to uh, universities in particular to force their students to read my books against their will. I'm not complaining. But my alma mater, Gonzaga University in Spokane, who every year ruins my bracket during March Madness, um, they forced their incoming freshmen to read Tattoos on the Heart. So they said, can you come and, and speak? And they had a big Tuesday night, a thousand people promised, you know. I said, sure. And then they said, could you bring two homies with you? And I do when people are gonna pay for it and it's not as, it's an it's uncomplicated trip, one, one stop. And uh, I always pick homies in the same way. I always pick among our trainees, I always pick enemies guys who used to shoot at each other just to force them to share a hotel room together, just to mess with them. And, and I always pick homies who have never flown before just for the thrill of seeing gang members panicked in the sky. <laughs> I remember a number of years ago, I was at LAX and two older guys who worked at home, we, gang members, we were flying to um, DC and one of them, dead serious, said to me, AG, are we flying Virgin Airlines because it's our first time? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, you know, actually, it's a requirement. Uh, we'll be coming home on American. So uh, I, I picked two homies, uh, Bobby, an African-American gang member who worked in our bakery at the time, and Mario, who worked in our merchandise store. Well, I've done this a thousand times easily with men and women. Uh, and you're always used to homies being a little bit nervous, you know, because they've never flown. Oh my God, I, nothing prepared me for this guy Mario because he was absolutely petrified to the bone. In fact, I'd never seen this before. He, you know, was hyperventilate, hyperventilating because he was so terrified, you know, <gasps> like that, you know, and we hadn't even 
you know, boarded the plane yet. And so we were at Burbank Airport, which is kind of a smallish airport and big bay windows, Southwest Airlines, big planes, but you don't have that hermetically sealed chute, you know, to board the plane. You have to walk out onto the tarmac like you're the president, you know, and they have those steps that get to the front of the plane and the big feature at Burbank are the steps that go to the back of the plane. So I'm sitting in Burbank next to Mario. Bobby's off exploring the airport and our plane arrives and uh, it's early morning and people are deplaning. And I turned to Mario and I said, hey, Mario, that's gonna be our plane. <gasps> like this, I think, oh my God, he may actually die before we climb those stairs. And so then I see our flight crew arrives, you know, pilots and flight attendants, and there are two flight attendants, females. Both of them have very large cups of Starbucks coffee, and they're schlepping up the front steps to the plane. And, and Mario goes, when are we going to board the plane? I said, well, you know, as soon as they sober up the pilots, um, <laughs> there they go now. Perhaps. I shouldn't have said that. So I should tell you that in our 31 year history as an organization, Mario is the most tattooed individual who has ever worked there, which is really saying something. He's all sleeved out, all his arms down to his fingertips covered in tattoos. His neck is blackened from jawbone to collarbone with the name of his gang. Head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin, eyelids that say the end so that when he's lying in his coffin at the end of his life there will be no doubt for anybody I guess well I had I had never been in public with him and and we were walking through the airport and, and honest to God people are like that mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely I'm thinking wow isn't that interesting because if you were happen to be at homeboy tomorrow and you walked up to anybody who worked there and you said quick give me the name of the most gentle soul who works here they will think for half a second they won't say me they'll say Mario yeah, Mario. Mario works in our cafe now. Mario is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing the world. Mario is proof that the highest form of spiritual maturity is tenderness. So we get to Gonzaga, of course, there's the Tuesday night talk. What they don't tell you is they've planned 93 other talks in the course of the day. This class, this class, this meeting, this lunch, this class, all damn day. And I go, oh, come on, you know what? So I said, look, I'm not gonna speak in any of these. So I tell them, I'm gonna sit in the back of the classroom. You guys get up and talk. Oh, they were terrified, especially Mario. But they did it. And they told their stories of terror and torture and violence and abuse of every imaginable kind. And honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a single day of either of their childhoods. So the nighttime talk comes and I coax them up before me to do seven minutes kind of a snapshot so that after my talk, I could have them up here for the Q&A session. And Mario was just so undone by this because it's a thousand people, but they got through it and they did a good job. Then I got up and did my thing and then I invited them to stand on either side of me and I go, yes, questions. Yes, ma'am, and a woman stands and she goes, yeah, I got a question, it's for Mario. First question out the gate. And Mario steps up to the microphone, he clutches it intently, and he's a tall, skinny drink of water, and, and he's just terrified, yes? And she says, well, Mario, you say you're a father, and, and you have a son and a daughter, they're about to enter their teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes, and he clutches the microphone, and I can sense he's starting to tremble and he's getting a friggin' hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell he's gonna say. And 
when suddenly he blurts out, I just... As soon as he says those two words, he rushes back to his microphone clutching closed eyed refuge. And now I know he's losing the battle with his tears, but he wants to get the whole sentence out. I, I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence until the woman who asked the question stands and now it's her turn to cry. Why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving, you are kind, you are gentle, you are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand total perfect strangers stand and they will not stop clapping. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hand, so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had returned him to himself. And everyone standing had been returned to themselves. And there's a word for that, and, and it's kinship. It's about standing against forgetting that we belong to each other. It's about looking in each other's eyes and saying, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And the soul feels its worth. Don't think for a second that Taft is the place you've come to. It's always gonna be the place you go from and you go from here to bravely stand at the margins so that the margins get erased, so that you can imagine a circle of compassion and imagine nobody standing outside of it. You go from here to dismantle the barriers that exclude. And soon enough, you cease to care whether anyone accuses you of wasting your time for in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. Thank you all very much.